Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Joyce Evola by moving on today to the second and final lecture on his collection of essays, The Metaphysics of War. This video will cover roughly the second half of this book, and that reason I recommend you to check out the first lecture. The link to that video is in the video description, but to be honest with you, because this is a collection of essays, each one of them can basically be read on its own terms. Um, but it's still, of course, useful to have have the big picture understanding of how Jules Evola understood war and the world of tradition in a way that's almost like unheard of today. It's like not even an option to think the kind of thoughts that you'll find within this text, which is what makes it a part of the School of Forbidden Text. This video is, of course, a response to a patron's request, and you can join us there and submit your own request to be part of the discussion within our Discord, etc., for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. I'd like to also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor refute any theories contained within the book under discussion, rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. So, in the essay Soul and Race of War, Evola notes that um, to the extent that heroism is allowed to be discussed at all in modernity, which is, of course, not very much, it is only referenced in an unsatisfactorily ambiguous sense, often through cliches of a sort of a irrational recklessness or an impulsive indifference towards dangers, which not only be contrasted with the rationality of modern civilized man. These are all, of course, really just euphemisms for the materialist viewpoint itself, and is contrasted with the kind of insights offered up by the higher spiritual viewpoint of the world of tradition. We can only fully understand the flaws in this misrepresentation of the hero of tradition, though, if we gain a holistic view of the civilizational decline which we are indeed living through, particularly through revisiting the quadripartite hierarchical view of society which was also discussed in the first lecture. Once again, Evola tells us that in the ideal society of, say, the Golden Age in the past, the spiritual elite assumed the position of authority even above the caste of a warrior noble, while the class that would today be called the bourgeoisie was ranked below both of them, and the uh, simple workers, who would be called the proletariat in modern terms, assumed their position at what might be interpreted as the bottom of this hierarchy. This ordering, though, thought of in those modern terms, is only offensive Evola reminds us, if we mistake it as a hierarchy of people, in which case the philosophy of democracy would assure us that they are all not only equal in value, but in fact exactly the same in character too. What that really means is, of course, that anyone who's normal will just be a uh, corporate careerist from the bourgeois caste. It's uh, funny how um, the equalization of all of these is really just another way of privileging only one of these castes as the norm for which all of these others are just failures to be or misunderstandings of that norm. But at any rate, he notes that in the world of tradition, this was seen not as a hierarchy of people, but rather as a hierarchy of functions, and in fact reflects the same ordering of functions which would be present in any man worthy of the name. For whom, as Evola says himself, the mind directs the will, which in turn dominates the functions of the organic economy, to which, finally, the purely vital forces of the body are subordinated. As taboo as such a topic might be to modern sensibilities, this quadripartite view of society in explicitly caste-based terms still holds immense hermeneutical value in allowing one to properly categorize different types of societies within history based on which one of these four classes had been granted the unspoken authority to guide the civilization as a whole in accord with its own caste-based principles. As mentioned in the first lecture, the meaning of war also changes with each phase. For example, when you have the spiritual elite in their rightful position, war is fought for the hero to obtain immortality. In the second feudalist phase, 
in which the warrior nobles assume the position of authority, war is fought explicitly for loyalty to a given prince. In the third phase of capitalism, war is fought for the bourgeois interest of defending a nationalistic homeland, but in this case understood in purely naturalistic or even economic terms. In the fourth phase of communism, you have war degraded to the status of the world revolution as described by Lenin. In all phases, the hero is something of a constant which might be seen as present in each, but it also undergoes changes in reflection of each shift's character. In the third phase, for example, the motivations of the warrior become explicitly passive. There's something which must be stimulated into action on Pavlovian grounds through the use of vividly hollow myths and ideologies which are merely meant to inspire the bodily passions from within, which are, of course, purely materialistic rather than spiritual in nature. The hero's readiness to die in battle, as I mentioned in the first lecture, eventually becomes so hermeneutically impoverished as to be misrecognized as the purely materialistic motif of cannon fodder prevalent in modernity. Evola admits, though, that the ideal of rule by the spiritual elite is found within recorded history itself, mostly within Indian civilization. While it certainly did exist in the West, it was largely within the prehistoric Golden Age that that was the case. Within the era of recorded history itself, the principle of rule had already shifted to the warrior nobility, who were only really overthrown by the modern revolution, such as the French and American ones, which, contrary to euphemisms of uh, seeking out freedom for its own sake, only succeeded in concentrating power into the hands of the industrial bourgeoisie. The communist revolution, therefore, must be properly recognized as only the most degraded and final phase in a long history of decline, in which they now just openly turn slave rule into a self-contradictory euphemism for the purely negative dissolution of all disclosures of proper civilizational form into, instead, the amorphous pseudo-form of an anonymous and fully interchangeable democratic mass of material bodies forced to serve the interests of a collectivized machine whose will goes beyond any of their control. We might even go as far as to call each of these four phases a different mode of construal to uh, borrow the term from Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, in which Peterson argued that the scientific mode of construal in which you're trying to um, flesh out the objective essences as determined by the scientific method is um, only one of two construals that you can use, use to approach the world, the other one being the uh, mythological mode of control in which you're not trying to understand what something is objectively, you're rather seeing how it fits within a general narrative, a story of how you as an individual are going to move from an obviously unsatisfactory present moment to a super idealized future. If you did not have that implicit map of meaning in the background, you would not even be able to exist because, of course, the only thing that keeps you going is the belief that that ideal future is someday going to arrive. So we might adopt this principle, but my modify it in properly Evolian terms to argue that the same object, like say the hero, will manifest itself, but not in equal terms in each of the phases, but rather more or less authentically, depending on how far along the process of decline you have progressed. Evola openly characterizes the ethics of war in something like these terms, and he notes that only if the civilization itself is ruled by the spiritual elite can the hero's own action be guided by the principle of seeking out immortality in battle rather than one of these more degraded misunderstandings of the hero's purpose? Even by the second phase of rule by the warrior nobility, for example, the ethics of war is already partially secularized as values like fidelity, honor, and loyalty had eclipsed those of a purely spiritual character which had defined the golden age. Worse yet, of course, are the bourgeois values of economic economic well-being and financial prosperity, which come to be misrecognized as <laughs> obvious or self-evident um, goods in themselves. In the last phase, he tells us the only ethics are those of materialized, collectivized, and deconsecrated work as supreme value.
One can use these four modes of control to trace the decline of virtually any other civilizational constant, even if it is not directly related to, say, war. And Vula does this for both agriculture and the family within this essay itself. Interestingly, he notes that the emphasis on the strong father figure as the patriarch so demonized by feminists in modernity is itself, they don't realize, only the first phase of decline indigenous to the warrior nobility mode of construal, while the bourgeois mode of construal, of course, further degraded the family to the a nuclear unit founded on nothing more than economic well-being and, at best, vacuous sentimentality, while the final communist phase found it fit to disintegrate the family altogether as nothing more than a roadblock inhibiting the ideal of a completely amorphous, anonymous, and interchangeable mass of material bodies. To return to the problem of combat, because the first phase construes combat as a literal form of spiritual asceticism, as I'd recommend you to check out the first lecture for a fuller explanation, the notion of fighting for any worldly interest, even the worldly interest of one's own people, only really arises with the partial secularization that you find within the second mode, that of the rule by the warrior caste. By the third bourgeois-dominated phase, euphemisms about fighting to spread democracy or overcome the tyranny of pre-modern aristocracies is revealed to have a purely economic meaning to anyone who can recognize the specific kinds of hermeneutical prejudices involved in such formations. Above all, this is just the desire to use war as a means to an end to seize monopolistic control of raw materials located overseas in order to maximize profits for industrial operations which are owned by the bourgeois caste itself. The final phase simply opens the floodgates for war to take on no longer a nationalistic cause, but rather an internationalized one, which can only be seen as legitimate if it furthers the goal of a global communist revolution. This globalist requirement finishes the process of collectivizing the warrior by undoing the very conditions for the hero itself to exist, reducing the fighter to a worker who had been seized by the demonic quest to finish the process of materialistic decline. Likewise, the hermeneutical contingency which the castes allow is recursively turned back even on the castes themselves. The uniquely despicable bourgeoisie of Western modernity is not at all a historical constant which has always been present in society, but was actually rather different even within the proper disclosure of the caste itself when it was subordinate to the spiritual elite during the Golden Age. That is to say, the third caste was unlike its modern form even back then. Likewise, Evola warns us that every usurpation has a degradation as its fatal consequence, in almost a Kaczynskian style of bringing about unpredictable emergent elements as a result of social transformations which are never really under any one person's control. Likewise, Evola contrasts the inferior one who stops at one of the subordinate meanings of war within the hierarchy of modes of control with the one who is superior enough to achieve the highest level of hermeneutical disclosure, that of a worldview in which the being of spirit over the becoming of materiality had seized its proper relation of dominance within that struggle. As an afterthought, I would argue that Evola's hermeneutics is quite different from that of Gadamer in the sense that for Gadamer, hermeneutics really goes on within just one single true layer, which is that of linguistic disclosure. This is something which he claims is an, an implicit norm towards which even nonverbal modes of expression like, say, sculpture, painting, or stone monuments are still teleologically oriented, even if they cannot actualize this tendency towards linguistification in reality. That is to say, if you have um, modes of interpretation that are not um, realized within the realm of language, they still have this tendency towards that ideal of the highest level of understanding, even if, say, a stone monument cannot actually reach that um, limit. For Evola, instead, this obsession with language 
in itself is just a consistent sign of the decline away from spiritual knowledge of tradition to the secularized and materialistic pseudo-knowledge of modernity. In fact, Evola noted at length within the um, revolt against the modern world that this obsession with language itself is characteristic of philosophers even as far back as, say, Socrates, or more recently Kant, who tried to explicitly understand what is in reality just the process of decline itself, rather than challenge it in any meaningful way, let alone seek out the real knowledge of the world of tradition, which was not simply linguistified, but was actually spiritual in nature. We might go even further, though, and argue that Evola's hermeneutics also differs from that of the early Chad Haig, for whom you have a hierarchy of layers, but one determined by the dominant physical resource at hand, rather than by the organization of the social order, a disclosure which is largely individual for Chad Haig rather than collective, insofar as the only question in my early philosophy is which soma had been registered as present by a given thinker. By emphasizing which of the four castes serves as principle of rule, though, Evola treats the horizon of meaning revelation as implicitly transpersonal rather than individual in nature. This is much like Jordan Peterson's claim, actually, that Jung's mythic archetypes can only appear after the social relation between different people within a given context had been determined or resolved. He gives the example that a drunk woman making advances at a bar is only disclosed as the positive erotic archetype of Venus if she is already determined as being single and consensual. She will, however, appear as the thoroughly negative archetype of something dangerous to be run away from immediately if she is drunk off her ass and the wife of a powerful and scary man. Peterson's emphasis on the materialism of neurological functions within the brain, however, is itself a secularization of Evola's recognition that the social order is itself a thoroughly spiritual concern, and one which can only be tampered with to the detriment of the entire civilization. Interestingly, Evola opens the essay The Aryan Doctrine of Combat and Victory by citing René Guénon and his claim that two consistent features of Western decline include the degradation of activity to something done simply for its own sake, as well as the contempt for contemplation as something useless and incapable of producing any results in the real world. Evola explicitly warns, though, that contemplation is not the modern notion of rationalism or any of the other kinds of empty games of manipulating symbols which the uh, pseudo-intellectuals of modernity pride themselves on being able to do. Rather, it was just the more normal and appropriate forms of participation in supernatural reality, which only came to be seen as something scandalous after the materialistic prejudices had degraded one's hermeneutical frame of reference to the kind of distortion taken for granted as normal in modernity. Further, it is only in modernity that action and contemplation could be misrecognized as inherently opposite terms, for in the Golden Age they were properly recognized as two distinct paths leading really to the same ultimate spiritual destination. Above all, the historical anomaly of disconnecting action from any transcendent spiritual principle led action to become a perverse mechanistic activity which could be done for its own sake, but only in this negative sense. For example, if one actually does perform the return to origins, one will find that war was once understood to be a struggle of metaphysical forces rather than, say, a struggle of nations or a competition of economic classes. For example, the solar principle fought against the monstrous titans or the feminine demonic archetype, but not merely in metaphorical terms. This makes perfectly good sense if one recalls that, as John McGregor himself mentioned in his earliest published book on hermetic magic, the, um, I think, 1996 Paths of Wisdom, he notes that to the traditionally based worldview, all apparent realities are symbolic.
For this reason, the Holy War, Julie Savilla uh, notes, was never a single concept, but was always divided into the Greater Holy War, which was concerned with the spiritual struggle, while the Lesser Holy War was the one which dealt with the lower realm of material and bodily concerns. More specifically, the Greater Holy War was seen as the battle within the man himself, the battle for spirit to subordinate the lower instincts and the naturalistic forces of chaos to the highest principle of order. Likewise, even without getting killed physically on the battlefield, through the asceticism of action and combat, he noted one can experience death, one can inwardly realize that which is more than life. For this reason, the Crusades were not solely about a dispute over the physical territory of the Holy Land, let alone simply economic interests, as a modern um, historian will claim, but instead used Jerusalem as a symbol for the metaphysical ideal of a city in the East through which one could gain immortality. For the former was actually just a prelude to the latter. For this reason, the Holy War does indeed satisfy the criteria of an action worthy to be done for its own sake, regardless of visible result, even including the physical death of the hero on the battlefield. It is no coincidence, then, that certain symbols continually reappear within the account of war in the world of tradition, such as the soul as genius, demon, or devil. How, though, can one understand these symbols? Well, in the world of tradition, Evil notes that the demon or devil was understood to be the life of life, or the mysterious force which was at work even in those elements of one's own life which were not directly accessible or transparent to one's own limited uh, frame of consciousness. Contrary to expectation, he notes that the mysterious powers of race and blood, quote unquote, were seen in the world of tradition to have a connection with this lower unconscious force, more so than with the conscious thinker in the modern Cartesian sense. Why then a symbolic connection between this and the goddess of victory? Well, to understand that, you have to realize that the afterlife was a good deal more complicated in the world of tradition than the modern simplification of everyone goes to heaven or hell after death. In the world of tradition, the immortality of the afterlife was not at all democratically accessible to anyone who dies. Quite humorously, by the way, a much lower standard even than anyone with a pulse, since anyone who doesn't have have a pulse includes quite literally everyone who will die at some point. This immortality of the soul was instead mostly understood to be a privilege for the hero who had specifically fought in battle. For the rest, Evola claims, the norm was something like a dissolution in Hades that was not, however, the same as the Abrahamic idea of hell. The goddess of victory, therefore, symbolizes a certain eruption of this unconscious life of life into a full actualization, which crosses over a certain barrier which would otherwise be inaccessible. Only the hero who really fights in battle can bridge this gap, which the ordinary, non-heroic civilian could never overcome. This, of course, goes far beyond the modern perversions of both a spirituality based on empty sentimentalism as well as a choice to believe what I cannot actually prove or justify, but also the materialist view of action as something entirely devoid of any spiritual significance. It is precisely this sort of action which is required in an era in which Evola warns that forces are gaining ground which can no longer be dominated by abstract ideas, universalistic principles, or myths conceived as mere irrationalities, and which do not in themselves provide the basis for any new civilization. Evola claims that if only one thing can be deduced with certainty from the events of the Great War, it was that modernity had come to be defined by an understanding of the relation between the state and the military, which was far from presuppositionless and was specifically rooted in class prejudices. Although one would simply take it for granted today that the military should be fully subordinate to the state 
and that the state itself should be ruled by a specifically bourgeois caste who only ever use the military as a last resort to continue politics by other means after other methods had failed to yield the desired result. This is actually a historically anomalous way to view the relation as well as the um, hierarchy implicit within this um, situation. Ever notice, for that matter, that we almost never speak of the warrior in modernity, but rather almost always talk about the soldier? Well, did you know that the latter term was itself etymologically speaking the traditional term for someone who fights for pay, and specifically for the interests of some other person who is of a decidedly non-warrior caste, typically of the bourgeois class? What about, instead, a state in which the military and its values came to dominate and define the broader civilization, rather than the other way around? Well, that actually is closer to the norm of tradition, and far from being less civilized than the modern universalization of bourgeois corporate class interests into all sectors of life, this actually enabled a far more ethical civilization to come to fruition, specifically through limiting the influence and power of the former. With this established, Evola claimed that the Great War might very well be interpreted as a certain showdown between these two worldviews. On one hand, you have those who fight to accelerate the process of decline, masquerading as the positive force of modernization, while the other represent the last residue of any traditional civilization within the West. The end goal was simply the establishment of a global police force which would impose an international set of conditions favorable to the economic activities which would increase the wealth of the bourgeois caste against the interests of those nations which would be too weak to protest against a de facto one-world government. Restoring the warrior rule, therefore, would not entail unbridled, violent chaos, as the ignorant might claim, but would instead bring about a far more sensible subordination of lower pathological drives to the higher ideals of ethical conduct and rationality. Whereas the modern world relies solely on legislation and a manufactured cultural normativity which is often pushed through through vividly Pavlovian means of conditioning, in order to artificially coerce a semblance of order into being. In the Varieties of Heroism, Evola noted that lest anyone consider the traditional view of heroism to be barbaric, one should just consider how freaking evil the 20th century Russian view of the no longer heroic soldier had actually become. In that case, they openly viewed them as so much human material to be used up as nothing more than cannon fodder, and which they would continue using up so long as there was plenty of supply of the stuff. The Russian soldier who accepted this grotesque disregard of his own human life did not do so, by the way, out of the traditional ideal of heroism, but rather through a certain dark fatalism with purely materialistic origins. This materialistic prejudice is, of course, that of a certain human machine in which the individual is explicitly recognized as nothing more than a replaceable cog in a much larger whole, a view which could only really arise at a fairly late stage in the process of technological overshoot. Do we find something even worse than that in the Japanese kamikazes who don't even have the option to not get used up as human ammunition against the enemy in a war which uh, one might be reminded they lost anyway? Whereas the Russian and Japanese notions of a heroism, quote-unquote, had indeed devolved into sub-personal status that no longer even preserved the personhood of the soldier whatsoever, Evola argued that the world of tradition was instead defined by an ideal of heroism which was super-personal. Although both are characterized by a certain disregard of danger, even to the point of death, this was for two radically opposed reasons. While the materialist accepts the destruction of his own soldiers as so much collateral damage, which even out ultimately in relation to the material gains which had been calculated for that 
specific mission, the hero of tradition faces death with the assurance that the material world is less real than spirit, and that which had no beginning can have no end, almost going back to the ideal, the deep meme of the circle rather than the arrow. Yet it was not only the belief that invisible forces were at work behind visible ones, for the man of tradition also believed that he could influence them through his own action, rather than simply accept his uh, pseudo-fate in a passive manner like the Russian and Japanese soldiers of World War II. In the Roman conception of victory, it will know that contrary to modern stereotypes of the wicked pagans of ancient Rome, the Romans were repeatedly described in their own historical context as actually the most religious of all mortals. Yet even modern scholars who disregard the wicked, uh, wicked pagan caricature still miss the point all too often by trying to account for Rome's greatness in strictly legalistic or even worse economic terms without realizing that these concepts simply did not exist in totally secular terms for the Romans themselves. Ultimately, this was because the Romans did not view the spiritual as something detached from this world, which could only at best be contemplated in the abstract. Instead, they understood the divine to be at work within this world, and therefore viewed history itself as the manifestation of the divine within time. Whereas the Greeks accepted fate as something blind, random, or inexplicable, the Romans instead viewed fate as the victory of order within time, which could not only be explained rationally, but could even be predicted in advance. Even the symbolism which the Romans used was therefore universal to the great civilizations of tradition, rather than any humanistic invention unique to only the Romans themselves. Nor was this symbolism empty, for it indicated a real spiritual presence on the battlefield, which can still, believe it or not, be felt today, in the era which actively denies its existence. Finally, in the essay Liberations, he noted that on one hand, the wars of the 20th century held the technological means to destroy one's entire home and all of one's material positions, uh, possessions sorry, in a single moment if a bomb happened to be dropped almost at random over one's city in Europe during World War II. While one could view this in the negative terms as chilling proof of how much more destructive modern warfare is than anything seen in the past, one might also argue argue that this only confirms the age-old warning from the world of tradition that material possessions are paradoxically less real than eternal spiritual absolutes, despite the fact that physical objects are, for the naive viewer, simply synonymous with the ontology of positive metaphysics, they're actually revealed to be a negation lacking in being. War is valuable in that it holds the potential to close the circle by bringing about a negation of negation far realer than that of German idealism. Far from being limited to ancient Hinduism, Lord Krishna's warning in the Gita, as discussed in Lecture 1, that you would actually be acting unethically if you decided not to fight the people that you had already loved in the past because you are simply giving in to the pathological temptation to see ephemeral and uh, insubstantial material realities as the highest standard of being. This is actually as true today as ever. Instead, of course, most people will cling even more to that tiny fragment of material existence over which they are nominally the owner, without realizing that even if that stuff survives the destruction of the war, it will still prove to be nothing more than a temporary illusion which they certainly cannot hold on to forever.